I know you're snooker loopy nuts, so here we go. Might as well, rather than just talking, I might as well try and sing it. So, uh, snooker loopy nuts are we, me and him and them and me. We'll show you what we can do with the load of balls and a snooker cue. Pot the red, then screw back for the yellow, green, brown, blue, pink and black. Snooker loopy nuts are we. We're all snooker loopy. Bum, 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 bum. Hello and welcome to the Snooker Loopy podcast. If it's your first time here, my name is Tom Mayhew. I am a comedian and I'm here with my very good friend. He's a very big YouTuber. You all know his voice. You all know his <laughs> face. It's uh, it's Joe, the Hitman Hallard. Oh, the Hitman. Mm. Well, there you go. There you go. I don't think Michael will be very pleased with that. Hello, Michael, if you're listening. Hey, has, he done, has he done the Let's Play on YouTube? I don't think he has. So, Well, he has got a YouTube channel, so... You know, and he has done the Stephen Hendry Tough Table Challenge, so, you know, um, on his own channel. He hasn't done it on Stephen Hendry's Q-Tips channel, so it's actually not an official attempt, oh, unfortunately. Oh, a bit of a rivalry going on there. Mm, but, uh, yes, wonderful to, to be here, and uh, hello to everybody at home or wherever you are listening to this. And, obviously, um, as we are recording this, it is very late on Crucible Eve, Tom, mm-hmm. and we have got a very exciting podcast coming up. Um, yeah, yeah. if you are new around here, don't expect it to be all serious like some podcasts out there. We are very much... Uh, a comedy snooker podcast we will have some very silly moments and we will take the mick out of s- certain players and they might be players that you like but that's all okay we're not going to be horrible but um yeah <laughs> don't all come at us when we predict judd trump to go out the first round okay <laughs> How did you know, Joe? How did you know? <laughs> yeah, but, but yeah. Uh, no, it's a pleasure to be here and looking forward to the, the next 17 days coming up. I'm sure we'll have a, a few of these podcasts out and yeah, it's going to be an exciting time, yeah, Tom. Well, as we speak, as you say, we're literally just over 12 hours from uh, from the start of the, the championship. It's a bit like, you know, snooker Christmas Eve, really. Like we're, we're 12 hours yeah. from Rob, Rob Walker coming down the chimney. And uh, <laughs> bringing the boys onto the base. Well, yes, or if you were listening to Radio 5 Live for the draw, is, what was it? Uh, Fellas on the Felt, I think. <laughs> I, was mean, what, um... I don't always agree with Sean Murphy, but that is rubbish, isn't it? Fellas on the Felt. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So that's the sort of thing you, you can expect around here. We'll come up with some cracking things. <laughs> there's, there's female players now, mate, so... <laughs> well, I, absolutely, absolutely, yeah. I'm not. I'm not entirely sure. Um, the two presenters, their names slip my mind, but I'm not entirely sure snooker was their usual sport of coverage. To be fair, so um, yeah, I, I'm not. I, I don't think he's just some misogynist uh, <laughs> guy who who hates Rihanna Evans. No, well, yeah, know. those those two presenters. There was uh, was it Helena? All droid and someone else who I didn't recognise, and they had Rob Walker to their to their right and Sean Murphy to the left. They had a lovely sort of snooker sandwich, and well, they were in the middle trying to lucky people. <laughs> Joe's had many dreams like that over the years. <laughs> yes, that's uh, part of the X-rated snooker extra after eleven o'clock. We talk about that BBC every episode. Two. I think we're going to have to make it. <laughs> Yes, yeah, absolutely. But yeah, I mean, let's go straight into it, I suppose, the World Championship. It's, uh, yes. I mean, you probably, as a snooker man, you probably do get excited, don't you? And I, f- I feel like um, the draw, should we, should we open with the draw? It's I, There aren't too many matches where I think for sure I know who's going to win, which I might see an obvious mm-hmm. thing to say, but... Um, yeah, I mean, uh, you, you know, I think, um, I think there's a, a fair few... Shocks on the cards. I mean, there there always is in the first round at the at the Crucible, but um, I think there's a lot of players going into this tournament out of form, and I think a lot of players that have gone into it have not played, you know, since March. Some of them, maybe even late February, for for one or two of them, if they didn't play in the in the classic. But um, yeah, it's, it's going to be an interesting tournament, interesting first round. Obviously, it can feel like it goes on forever, the first round. I, I feel um, the only thing that's sort of rivaled by that is the 
uh, is the semi-final because the semi-final goes on for three days when the the final only happen goes on for two days. So that that's always um, quite an interesting quirk of the the length of matches. But yeah, I mean, obviously, I, I think that the place to start is with the the defending champion, seven time champion, looking to become the the record. Uh, eight times world champion and that's uh, the rocket ronnie who's starting up at 10 o'clock in the morning um and he's he's playing a quite exciting talent really mm. uh who's only really come on the the scene over the last few months uh got to the final of the the classic didn't he pang jung su who uh came from four nil down against crafty ken in qualifying and uh ken had that easy pink to the corner to make it 5-0 and, and how different it could have been had that went in but uh, I guess we'll never know but how do you see that one going Tom? And- well I mean obviously everyone's going to make Ronnie the favourite but I do think it's um, a very tricky draw like I'd actually would say Pang is probably the best of the debutants this year um, I think he's looked very good in, in across the season I think he had a very good debut season this is only his second yeah. year on tour so he's he's done very well yeah um yeah and last time ronnie played a player who was a debutant was james cahill and um <laughs> well I think that was yeah. the last time he played actually no i think he played mark joyce when he was a, a debutant as well but, yeah um, i don't count uh, mark joyce in that that same bracket really just just because mark david uh, mark joyce has been on the tour a long time whereas as cahill was a genuine youngster in that, wasn't he? But uh, I mean, the the only um, the only comparison I really have here um, to a sort of similar up and coming player was was Ronnie took on Ding mm-hmm. in the first round in the I think it was two thousand and seven World Championship, and I believe that year he also played him in the Masters final. So that was quite a weird quirk that Ding got to the final of the Masters but still had to qualify for the Worlds. Mm-hmm. That's uh, Bizarre, but he, he absolutely thrashed Ding that day, 10-2. Um, was that the um, so, very emotional final where Ding tried to concede early? Yeah, 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 That that's the one. I think it was 10-3 in the final that, that day. But that that's one of my earliest memories, actually, of watching Ronnie on a little sort of 10-inch portable TV. I don't know if you, if you had a TV with a... VHS uh, slot in it. Those were the days, mate. Well, Those were the days. Yeah. Um, yeah so yeah, I had that. Had that. Probably one of my uh, <clears throat> early memories as well. Like I always remember that Ding was clearly upset, and I think people in the audience yeah. were very pro Ronnie, and that was upsetting him. And I remember yeah, yeah, yeah. clearing up at one point and kind of having to go at the crowd so to go, no, you should support this lad as well. And that that was a real amazing moment from Ronnie. I was like, you know, he should get respect for mm. moments like that because he does, he, you know, yeah. he sticks up for. Uh, the I know he get, he does slag off a lot of young players, but I think he also does stick up for a, a, a lot of them. If he's supposed, to... I think he sticks up for the 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 young players that he knows there's something about. Yeah, you know, I, I mean, he's been very close to Ding over the years, hasn't he? Um, he probably sees a bit of uh, himself because he was on the scene so yeah. young. He probably, uh, you know, I mean, Ding was ridiculously young yeah. when he came on the the scene. Um, you know, winning the UKs. I mean, he must he, he mustn't be much older than Ronnie was when he won the UK championship. Yeah, so he was a teenager, wasn't he? So yeah. So um, I, I mean, you know, Ding's only thirty six now, so it's uh, fairly young in, in these days mm-hmm. in snooker terms. When you you look at the likes of Stuart Bingham, I think won the worlds at the age of, of forty or, or very close to forty. Mm-hmm. Um, his first world title, so so Ding's still got time, but uh, yeah, we've been sidetracked completely from what we're talking. About. This always happens, <laughs> but yeah, um, I think I think it will be very similar to that match actually. If Ronnie is um, up for it, and and he seems to be, and it certainly is. Pre World Championship persona seems to be good. You know, he's posting little short videos on twitter you know he's obviously got his shop in sheffield he's had that for the last couple of years um he's announcing some sort of thing early tomorrow morning uh he's already been saying stuff like you know i think i saw a picture of a i believe i saw a picture of a bag on twitter the other day and he said oh could this right. be for the eighth title so he's he's confident you know what i mean he, he yeah it. yeah 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 
Yeah, no, absolutely. I think um, I think he's up for it. I think he's 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 got a comfortable draw. I think you know when we look at the the draw open up, I think most of the players that he he could come up against, he's very comfortable. Mm playing against if he wants to and um, I mean the only exception to that would potentially be Mark Selby in the final but that that's a long long way away um, but uh, yeah I mean I, I, you know I've predicted Ronnie to come through that match yeah. I think he'll come through fairly comfortably if I'm honest I think you have to you have to go for Ronnie I think as defending champion he's going to uh, he's going to want to play his very best snooker so i think he will have yeah. been practicing he'll say he hasn't he'll say no i've just been <laughs> running for the past five years but um well <clears throat> i mean funnily it's funny you should say that he's actually hooked up with um steve feeney again from sight right oh, okay. so which which is when which is who he was with in 2019 when he went on that incredible run i think he won what five ranking titles that season mm. well five titles if you include the um the the champion of champions in there i believe but that was the year he won the uk's he won the tour championship he got his thousandth century it was, he got back to number one there was a lot of good things going when he bought back into the site right i think and um I think that's only a good sign. You know, he's he's had a very poor season by Ronnie's standards. He's still won two tournaments. Yeah. Um but he, you know, he's he's always had one match in a tournament that he's just not turned up for. So, where luckily in the World Championship that tends to just be a session and you always have one bad session in a World Championship yeah. and if you can get through that um then who knows? I you know, I, I think a lot of people are, are <laughs> putting Ronnie as favourite. I don't really know where they're getting that from. You know, if you look at his form this season, but um, he will be difficult to beat, I think, over over long distances anyway, for most players. I'd say he's got a pretty easy round to the, the quarterfinals, really, because his his round two opponent will be either Ding or Hossein Pafai. Now, he beat Hossein fairly comfortably last season at the Worlds, and his record against Ding is pretty one-sided, I would say. Yeah. Um, so which of those do you think will be his opponent in round two? I mean, I do think it'll be Hussein, actually. Oh, really? I've, I've backed Hussein to beat Ding. I, I watched a bit of Hussein in qualifying, actually, and he, he looked somewhere back towards his levels from last season. I think he had had a, a bit of a rough season, really. For his standards, um, I'm amazed he's not in the top sixteen. To be honest, yeah, and I think that's because he's not had a, a great season. Uh, you know, he's not really got to the latter stages of too many events. I know he beat Mark Selby at the UK Championship and the Masters this year, but um, yeah, I, I, I do back Hossein uh, to beat Ding. I'm still not convinced by Ding. I think he's had a a very rough few years, and he's had one good run to the UK Championship final, mm. which has sort of carried him a little bit this season, much like his victory at the UK Championships did mm -hmm. a few years ago. So I'm I'm not convinced by Ding. I think it'll be a close match, but um, yeah, I've backed Hussein to win it. Well, I think I might go for Ding for that one, but uh, we will we will see. I will just do uh, round one for this. This episode of the podcast and yeah. in future episodes during the World Championship, we will basically see which of me or Joe was right and which of mm -hmm. us does not deserve to be on the podcast. <laughs> Absolutely, yes. So the, the next match in the draw is Luca Bracel uh, against Ricky Walden. Now, you're a massive fan of Mr. Walden, aren't you, Joe? I am a huge fan of Ricky Walden. You've got his poster on your wall. <laughs> yeah, yeah, the, those that exist. <laughs> um all those, all those wonderful posters of Ricky Walden. But I mean, you know, he's won three ranking event titles. Mm -hmm. You know, there's not many players that have done three or more. You know, there's quite a few that have obviously won one. Mm -hmm. um, some of them have backed that up and won two, like Michael White. But not many, not many go on and win three or more. So uh, th there's real quality to Ricky Walden. Uh, look at Brassell, Funny stat: he's still not won a match at the World Championship. So this is wow. an interesting, 
Well, not at the Crucible. Yeah. So this is actually an interesting match up, I think. And Brassell, again, I've not really seen any evidence of him this season uh, to suggest that he's going to do well. I think I backed him to reach the semi-final last year. He had he had such a good season coming up up to it and um, he had actually a, a reasonable draw looking at it last year. But yeah, he's just, he's not convincing me. And I'm, I'm not sure his attitude is is quite there for snooker. Um, Ooh, fighting talk from Hannard here. It... <sighs> He's very, very talented. Don't get me wrong. I'm just, I'm not convinced that he puts a hundred percent in all of the time. If I'm honest, now that that's a very big thing for me to say because I don't know Luca personally, <laughs> and I probably never will after this. But well, um, Joe, I've got a surprise guest for you. Here yeah. he is. It's, <laughs> <laughs> it's Luca. <laughs> but I, I don't know. That's just the impression I get, and I suppose. He's very chill. People said the but... same about Judd, didn't they, for a long time? And then he eventually kind of matured a bit and found his form and had a great couple of seasons. And I think that's the sort of thing that could happen to Luca Brassell. You know, I, I think they're very, very similar players, actually. You know, a couple of, a couple of runs uh, of the ball differently, and Luca Brassell could be a UK champion. He could be, um, you know, a multiple ranking event winner. But he's not at the minute. Um and I, uh, I don't know. I, I don't see him beating Ricky over nineteen. And they also played each other a few years ago, and Ricky did win that match as well. Well, I mean, this is uh, you've swung me there, Joe. I was going to go with Luca, but literally <laughs> on the podcast, you've made me go. What am I thinking? Madness. Let's go for Ricky Walden. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's uh, Ricky Walden is one of those players you don't know which one's going to turn up. He played very, very well against uh, Tepchaya yeah. in the... <laughs> you found that funny, well, did you? Well, just if you don't know um... which one's going to turn up, as if he, he, he puts on a different mask and you go, oh, God, it's that Ricky Molden. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, I know he's had a few health problems over the last um, few years, so it'll be good to see him have a run at, at the Worlds, actually. I think, I think I'd love to see him back in the top 16 and regularly... You know, fighting for these events because I, I think that's where he belongs. You know, he is a a bit like a Marco Fu, actually, um, a player that I think can definitely be consistent up there. But yes, it was ten six back in two thousand and eighteen, where Luca Purcell was the thirteenth seed. Funnily enough, wow. so there you go. Okay, well, yeah, I think I will. I'll go with Ricky Walden. Uh, the next one is Mark Williams against. Jimmy Robertson and I mean it's very hard to to bet against um, Mark, isn't it? Well, yeah, uh, you know he's had a very good couple of seasons. Um, played very very well at the Masters. Was unlucky not to win that against Judd. He has been very much the nearly man over the last two years, and maybe this will be the tournament that it that changes that. And I, I hope it, it is in some ways. You know, I would love to see Mark win another world title. I'll put him up there with Higgins and Selby. I think that's the least he deserves, really, to be on the same number of world championships as them. Um, yeah, Jimmy Robertson, I have to say I'm, I'm a bit surprised he qualified, actually. I think that was certainly somebody I was looking at in the qualifiers draw and thinking people will fancy... Um, playing him but because he again he's not had a great season so you know last year i think he was in the top 16 on the one year list and i don't think he's been anywhere near that this year so yeah but uh, i'm backing williams all the way on that one yep Uh, i have to go for mark as well you know i mean he has been a nearly man he was famously uh nearly naked in 2018 (laughs) all except that towel hey Thank God for Barry Hearn. A bet Fred towel. A bet Fred towel, eh? Uh, so the next match is Judd Trump against Anthony McGill. And now we know already, I presume, we're going for McGill, based on what you said earlier? <laughs> well, uh, this match could go one or two ways, in my opinion. I think Judd could come out um, and play out of his skin 
and win it comfortably 10-3, 10-4, because Miguel's not really had a great season either. Uh, and again, you know, a player that I'm not that surprised... Uh, I'm, I'm quite surprised he did qualify. Or we have the Trump from the last two years who is just sort of grinding along and not really not really showing the form of his his early career. And McGill, I, th- I think McGill could tie him up in knots, to be quite honest with you. I think Because McGill's got quite a slow game. I think he can really frustrate Judd. I think uh, the crowd could get on McGill's side a little bit. I believe as well McGill is um, one of the players who's been chatting to Mr. Ebden um, in terms of help with their... <laughs> approach to the game their singing ability oh <laughs> right okay sorry I mean, sorry he was working on an album it's going to come out very soon um. <laughs> i mean you know he certainly seems to have taken inspiration from peter ebden with his hairstyle so <laughs> <laughs> you know uh, but no i mean mcgill is one of those players um who, who makes some comments in the media and i think looks a bit of a muppet sometimes if i'm honest um Considering again, he's been chatting to Peter Ebden recently. <laughs> but considering McGill, you know, doesn't have a massive pedigree in the game, got to the semi-final one year at the Crucible, and all of a sudden seems to be branded a Crucible specialist. I'm not sure about that necessarily, but yeah, I mean, I've backed McGill to beat Trump. I think he will really get in his head. I think Trump will be frustrated. I think we'll see a lot of him with his head in his hands and. Yeah, I'm going to go McGill, and I'm going to go 10-6, 10-7. Oh. I mean, I think I would maybe go for McGill, but um, as you say, it, it depends what Trump turns up. And, I mean, Trump can, you know, sometimes he plays awfully and manages to grind out a win, and I think it might be a, a bit of a tough watch, because if McGill does basically do an Ebden and try and get in his head, it, it could be a... I, I, yeah, I just think McGill's going to wind him up. I don't know why I think this, but I, I just... You know, there was that thing with Jamie Clark a couple of years ago, wasn't there? And I, I just think something similar will happen. I don't know why. And it's got nothing to do with the fact that my Crucible tickets might involve seeing Judd Trump next Saturday, so... <laughs> Mate, you'd love to go watch Judd Trump against Jack Wazowski. It's got nothing, nothing to do with that. I promise. I mean, you could boo them, mate, live. <laughs> yeah, from the fourth row, get kicked out from the crucible. Watch <laughs> yeah. right in the audience, please. Sounds great. <laughs> well, yeah, because his opponent will be either Jack Lizowski or Nopan Sankan. Um, and obviously the media are already shouting about how they want him to be Trump against Lizowski. Um, because that will be the best match in snooker history. Because they're the golden boys of snooker, and everyone, <laughs> even though it'll probably be thirteen to Judd Trump, but you know, <laughs> based on previous meetings, absolutely, yeah. yeah. Um, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't write off Nopan because um, mm. you know he he did well in the Crucible last season, um, and he's he's one of those players who, a bit like Hossein, is kind of on the cusp of breaking through to the top sixteen. And actually, I think. With um, a couple of top 16 players being suspended, I think it does mm. open the door for the likes of Nopon and uh, Hossein to you know, make that breakthrough and really like, solid- solidify mm. themselves in the top 16. Mm. Yeah, uh, you know, I, I actually um, quite like Jack Lazowski. I think he's a bit of a Marmite character for a lot of snooker fans. Um, but he is somebody, I think that has a lot of talent. I think he's a very, very well-spoken person as well. When you hear him in interviews, I, I do enjoy listening to him. And I do hope he, he wins a tournament soon, I think. Do you feel like uh, he's got the same problem that you said Luca Brassell has? I think a couple of years ago, yes, but I do I do believe that Jack Lazowski's putting in the work now. I think he's maybe seen what's happened to his good mate Trump, you know, um, as they say, best mates, whatever. Yeah. Um, yeah, so, yeah, I think, 
I think he is putting the work in. I think a tournament is around the corner for him. He played unbelievable at the UK Championships. Um, You know, every time I see him, he seems better. Whether that will take him to win five matches at the Crucible, I'm I'm not entirely sure. But um, I have backed him to to beat Nopon. I, I agree with you. I think... I think actually Nopon's probably the the worst player he could have drawn. Mm-hmm. I don't know why I think that, but um, you know I think everybody else he'd sort of have a, a a good feeling against. But yeah, there's something about Nopon and his crucible recent crucible record that might squeak him through. I think it'll be a close match, but Jack Lazowski tends to be good at getting out of the first round, so. Yeah, and it could be a good tournament for him if he if he does get through it. I'm gonna, I think I'll opinion. back Jack as well for that. I mean, how would you feel? How would you feel watching McGill against Lazowski? Because I, I presume that's not uh, what you were dreaming of when you booked your tickets. Uh, well, so it's not the dream. No disrespect but, um, to either player, of course. Um, but obviously, you're no. a big, big Ronnie fan, and you maybe would yeah. like to see someone like or Ricky Walden you know, against you know. Mark Williams. You would have been ecstatic. Oh, that would have been awesome. But. Um, yeah, I, you know, I do like Jack Klazowski, so I'm hoping he gets through because I think it'll, I think it would be good to watch him live. I think yeah, he's a very talented player. So, um, and I, well, I'll speak about what the 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 other match could be on the other side. Of, well, on my side of the arena, hmm. um, but I am fairly close to the middle. So, yeah, but uh, no, I've had, you know, Trump uh, uh, Lazowski versus McGill that that'll be all right. That'll do. To be honest, Judd versus Jack, it'll, it could be a Crucible classic, you know, so... I mean, it would be attacking at the very least. It's not going to be mm. uh, like a Fergal O'Brien frame, is it? So... <laughs> I guess you wouldn't yeah. get value for your money, though. It'd be over very quick. Mm. Well, speaking of quick, next player is uh, one of the fastest on tour, Robert Miltons. He's taken on Joe Perry. And this is quite a, a strange encounter, really, because they're two traditionally qualifiers uh, yeah. um, playing each other. So, you know, it's an excellent opportunity for either of them to get through to the, the round of 16, which, you know, doesn't happen that often. You know, bo- Both of them have had a handful of victories in the first round, I think, in in the past. Um you know, Joe Pe- uh, Robert Milton's beat Neil Robertson a couple of times uh, years years and years ago. But um, yeah, how do you see that one going, Tom? It's it's uh, it's an interesting match that it's, one. It's incredible, really, when you think that Joe Perry won his second ranking title at the age of something like forty nine or forty eight last year, I think. Yeah, uh, and Robert Milton's won his first ranking title and his second ranking title. Uh, last year and this year at the age of like 47 so both and they both won the Welsh Open yeah exactly and both sort of massive surprise players who people thought might have been winding down their careers and now they're Mm -hmm. playing each other at the Crucible it's it's surreal really but um, I mean Milkins' form because he's been incredible in, in some games this season absolutely astonishing I don't know where he's found it but he's just found something in the past couple of years that's really um made him play like, well, he's back in the top 16, and, and it's the best I've seen him play, to be honest. So, mm. Well, I, I mean, I've never known him to be in the top 16, so uh, well, he, I, don't, I don't, he, don't know when he's been in in the I past. I think he was but... for a while, because I remember his uh, his walk-on for a few years in a row was, I'm a cider drinker. <laughs> yeah, I, I, no, I, as I say, I don't I have no idea. I will look into it. but um... His walk-on this season, I think it's going to be... I've got a new combine harvester, so there we go. Oh wow! There you go. Now I'm looking at his ranking history. So um, 231, 91, 99, 175, 54, 33, 21, 28, 26, 32, 47, 51, 55. Um, this is like the weirdest bingo ever. Well, yes, yeah. You've got to mark these off quickly in your on your card as well. <laughs> uh, he got to number eighteen in 2014. He did get a number sixteen in at the end of twenty sixteen, but other than that, he's he's not been in the top sixteen ever before. So I assume this is his highest ranking oh, ever. He must have just qualified quite a lot then, because I, you know, I really rec- I, re- I remember seeing him a few years in a row and being like, oh yeah, it's the 
the guy with the weird walk on music. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I mean, for the World Championship, it seems like he has qualified quite a few times there, so that might be where it came from. Um, I would, I'd fancy Milkins to, uh, if he plays anywhere near like he has played this season, I think he'll win that fairly comfortably. Okay, yeah. What do you think? Yeah, no, I, I can back that. I'm not sure Perry's at his best. It was quite a Shredsville m- match uh, against Mark Davis in the, the qualifiers. Obviously, he had that unbelievable end to that match. But, I, 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 I he, mean, he just to the, take... Uh, a... On the, the black ball, is that right? Yeah, so Mark Davis was, was down playing the pink. Very similar to the one Ken missed. I don't know if you've seen the one Ken missed yeah. in his match. But, uh, yeah, it was almost a carbon copy and... Yeah, Davis missed that, and uh, Perry knocked in a, a really good black to win it, actually. But, uh, I mean, lots of people, just, just to take a minute out of the podcast here, uh, lots of people talking about, oh, let, give Mark Davis a invitational tour card. Um, you know, he's been 30 years a pro, uh, this, that, and the other. And, you know, people feeling really, really sorry for him uh, that he's lost his tour card. And, and you know, it... it obviously is a sad moment but he's played poorly for two years that's why he's dropped off the tour you know it's not like Marco Fu who literally couldn't get to tournaments mm-hmm. yeah. you know the, the, there's a big difference there for me it's it's um it's a bit ludicrous I think people were getting a little bit help and considering how people usually talk about wild cards and this that and the other it did make me chuckle a little bit um but good stat for you, Tom. Mm-hmm. First time ever in snooker that there's not been a professional with the surname Davis. Really? Yep. No way. Because we had obviously you had Fred Davis, Steve Davis. Not, yep. Um, so obviously it was Joe and wow. Joe and Fred. Yeah. Fred overlap with Steve. Steve overlap with Mark. Yeah. And then Mark. Has just lost his. Well, unless we get somebody on Q School well, with the surname I mean, Mark, Davis, I think Mark but... will be entering Q School. And, oh, um... I, yeah, absolutely. But you know, you look at Michael Holt, you look at Andrew Higginson. It's not going to be easy. But one of the so... most talented youngsters is Liam Davis. So, spells like it's ah, but it's it's I E S. That's the problem. Does it not count then. Um, not for me. Oh, not for me. That's it. No. That could have uh, been another Davis for the next 30 years. Because that's actually one of my pet haters when I see on um, descriptions for WSC. It's got Steve Davis with uh, IES on the back. And it's just, yeah, it's funny. But, um, yeah, I mean, speaking of, just very quickly, speaking of wild cards, obviously Jimmy White has uh, got his tour card on merit. Yeah. He's, you know, he was third on the one-year list uh, of those who haven't got their uh, tour card for next season. So he's got two more years on the tour, and you know, if he can have two seasons the way he's performed this year, there's nothing to say that he couldn't get back into the top sixty-four at the age of nearly sixty-four, which <laughs> would, would be quite the start, wouldn't it? Yeah, you'd have to but, uh, um, say a cover of the Beatles song when I'm sixty-four. <laughs> When I'm when I'm number sixty four in the when world, I'm yeah. 64. <laughs> Which you you know, I think he's ranked something like number seventy, and it's a real shame. I think that when you've regained your tour card, you don't get to keep your money from the last two seasons. It's uh, it's a shame he has to start from zero again. Yeah, because there's so many players who seem to always be. Stuck on the just just outside that top sixty four. Yeah, it just it, it seems like the system is just broken. I think because the the person in sixty fourth gets to keep all of their money from the last two years, but the person in number sixty five doesn't, and that's yeah. If they're staying on the tour, I, I get it. If you um, qualify again through Q school, mm. that you should start from zero. But I think if you just keep your tour card because you were one of the top four in the one-year list, I I think that should absolutely be looked at as you keep your money from the last two years, just in my opinion. Because generally they're going to be the people very close to the top 64 anyway. So, 
No, I agree. But, uh, yeah, uh, good to see. Good to see. I know a lot of people were very happy to see that. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't think... Um, I mean, definitely not... I don't think even Steve Davis earned a Torf card in his 60s. Is that right? I think he retired. He had invitational cards in his 60s, possibly. Yeah, I mean, he was in the top 16 at the age of 50. I mean, that's a pretty impressive stat. Mm-hmm. Uh, but... No, by the end of his career, he will have been... I'm not even sure at the age of 60 he was playing, to be honest. But yeah, anyway, I mean, to to keep your tour card at the age of 60 is pretty <laughs> unheard of, isn't it? In, in yeah. I don't know if yeah. anyone's actually done it before, especially not in this modern age. Well, I think Fred Davis will have. Because um, I think he got a century at the age of 63 or something at the Crucible, so bonkers isn't it but yeah uh anyway that that was a nice little detour um uh moving on from robert milkins and joe perry uh i'll back robert milkins in that encounter as well um back to uh, one of the (laughs) more questionable of the legitimacy of this uh (laughs) tie but uh sean murphy versus c joey who um who Obviously, uh, caused one of the one of the the most controversial outbursts. I think it, that that reached you know national media of snooker in recent years. And of course, uh, C beat Sean at the UK Championships while he was an amateur playing as an amateur. And Sean famously uh, said he he doesn't think amateurs should play on the tour. He was it was a bit of sour grapes from him, I think, uh, and he's admitted that himself. You know that he was. He was speaking in the heat of the moment. Um, probably had a, a microphone shoved in his face by Rob Walker, you know, at the end of the match. But uh, yeah, that'll be an interesting match. I don't quite see it going the same way. I've got to be honest. I mean, to be honest, I don't think Sean should be allowed in the competition. I think he's uh, he's taken food <laughs> off the table of of C. That's, C needs yeah. to feed his family. <laughs> Yeah. Was... Well, I mean, a couple of years ago, Sean beat Lou High Sh- No, no, it was um, Lou Hong Hao, I think it was. He whitewashed him, didn't he? Um, he beat him 10 0. Uh, and I wouldn't be surprised if we had a similar scoreline here. Well, I don't think it's going to be that bad. Because Lou Hong, Hong Hao losing like that was like a record, wasn't it? Like it was the first time there's been yeah. a, a yeah, whitewash yeah. for. For decades. Well, football. since uh, Parrot beat Eddie Charlton, I think. 10 so I don't quite think it'll be a uh, a whitewash. I mean, I would make Sean the favourite. I think you kind of have to, especially mm. over a longer match. But um, uh, C is one of those who, you know, I think for a, a few of the, the debutants this season, it'll be how quickly they settle. Because a few of them are fairly young, you know, in yeah. their early 20s or even I think one of them was 19 and a lot of it will come down mm. to how much they settle how much the nerves get to them because we can we know they can play we know they're very good but at the crucible it was a very different experience yeah you know I think in the past a couple of seasons you would have maybe backed C to knock Sean Murphy out in the first round to be fair but um Sean's been immense since the turn of the year Actually, since before that, he played very well at the UK Championship as well. Um, and I think he could be somebody that could go very far in this tournament. So, yeah, I'm backing Sean to win. OK. Um, next match is player of the season, Mark Allen, against a ranking title winner who had a pretty awful season before he qualified in Fang Zheng Yi. Yeah, and we talked about him on the last podcast, didn't we? And said, and you said you wanted him to qualify mm-hmm. because you don't want him to be just somebody that drops off the tour, never heard of again. And to be fair, he's done it for you. He's done it. That, he's that's done why it I'm a fan. You know, um. <laughs> a fan of fan. Yeah, yeah. I mean, Mark Allen has had a very good season. I think he's world number two, to- Joe. World number two coming into this. <laughs> yeah, um, I think he perhaps took advantage of lots of players 
not having a good season. I thought you were going to go, lots of players being suspended. Being but, suspended. But no. Uh, but yeah, I, you know, Mark Allen, um, I mean, had he not had a good season this year, could have quite easily had to qualify, to be quite honest with you. Uh, <laughs> you which can is... say that about literally every player, John. <laughs> Well, yes, but but Mark Allen uh, was one of those who could have lost a lot of money this season yeah. um, on previous performances. So, yeah, I think I think he's uh, I think he's in a good place going into the World Championship. But again, ten out of the last eleven crucibles, Mark Allen hasn't made it past the second round. So that's. Um, that's that's tough, but I, I think he'll win the first round match. I don't I don't doubt that, but I think to back him to go all the way is is bold, and I know a lot of people are. Well, I I do. I think he's got a pretty good chance of getting past the second round this year because I I do feel like he he should beat Fan fairly comfortably if he plays like he's played all season, and his opponent is either going to be Stuart Bingham or David Gilbert. And both of these players are players who this season have played not great. They've both been players who've slipped out the top 16. So yeah, I think yeah. they'll both be pretty delighted to have drawn each other, to be honest. I mean, again, you know, I, all the players I talked about in terms of having a bad season, <laughs> I can't see them pulling it around for the World Championship and winning two best of 19s. Dave Gilbert was top of that list for me, really. Uh, you know, he's, he looked like he'd fell out of love with Snooker. Um, seeing his interviews after qualifying, he seems to have that bit of personality back mm. in him. You know, he, he seems to be up for it. Uh, and actually, this is the uh, the other second round match that, that I could be watching. Um, Mark Allen versus David, David Gilbert, potentially. Um, that's what I'm backing it to be. I think they, I think Stuart is. Oh, um, to be Bingham, so you can shout out, show us your hot tubs. I know, show us your hot tubs. But yeah, I mean Stuart, Stuart Bingham. Um, yeah, he's he's not had a, a great season. He's not had a great couple of seasons, if I'm honest with you. I'm I'm a bit surprised. I think it's his World Championship runs that are keeping him in the. Top 16 at the minute. Yeah, it is. I mean, it definitely is living at the rankings, to be honest, because he's not, he's not picked up any titles. Um, obviously, he was in the semi-finals two years ago, so that would be dropping off his ranking points. Yeah, I th- you know, he could be somebody that drops into the <laughs> the, the 20s or 30s uh, at the end of the season, depending on how results go. So it's a, it's a big tournament for him. I mean, provisionally, he is set to drop to number 29 if he loses in the first round, Ooh. which is bonkers considering he is, you know, a reasonably mid-tier seed, isn't he? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, you know, well, he's been a solid so. top 16 player for a, a decent chunk of time and, you know, world champion. Yeah, I think he had a qualify last year, was it? Was it last year he had to qualify or, oh, yeah, or the year got, before? Is, yeah, and he got, was it last year he qualified in... Um... It was one, one of the years anyway, he had to qualify and then went far in the tournament so yeah, I mean he, I think he's got about the worst draw he could have had in Dave Gilbert I've, I've got to be honest, I think Yeah I think, I think he's in trouble but he, you know, he's a very heavy scorer He's one of the actually, actually one of the most attacking players on tour, which I don't think you'd really get that impression of him. <laughs> to be honest, I don't know why it is about Bingham, but you you wouldn't expect him to be somebody that has made as many one four sevens as he has. As you know, he's made as many century breaks as he has. <laughs> what are you giggling at? Just I why, could see you giggling. Why don't you get that impression? Is it because you think I don't, he's, I don't he's know? Because he's got a hot tub company. <laughs> No, I don't. I don't know. I, I suppose because uh, you know, until he won the world title, yeah. he'd not really done a lot in the sport. So, a bit like uh, Robert Milkins or Joe Perry, for that matter. So, we'll see. But I, I've backed Gilbert, especially at the Crucible. He he'd done nothing, had he, before he won it? 
I think it was the first time he'd reached a quarterfinal, so it was incredible. Like, yeah, and then he played Ronnie in the quarterfinal. Yeah, I think I think he played Ronnie, then um, Judd in the semi-final, yeah. and then Sean Murphy, who was in incredible form in the final. So you know, he had a hell of a run to win it, and who knows, he could well do it again. I mean, I'm going to go for Bingham to beat Gilbert, but I think that could go either way, and it could be a 10-9, to be honest. But I just... Part of me feels like Bingham will... Uh, he'll find something because he has to. He, he feels like that yeah. kind of player. Like, when he had to yeah. qualify, he did, and he got himself back in the top 16 by qualifying. So I just feel like he's that he's that kind of player who, whenever people write him off, he finds something. Absolutely, yeah. Um, Ellie Carter against Jack Jones. I can only see this going one way, although it is one of the classic matches. A bit like Jamie Clark a couple of years ago when he beat Mark Allen, I think it was, in the first round. Um, it could it could well go the other way. Ali Carter seems to be back to, you know, reasonably near his best. Mm-hmm. Uh, and he's got a decent crucible record, obviously, two-time finalist. He's had multiple semi-finals as well, so, Yeah. Uh, I've I've backed Ali, but yeah, I can't I can't see past Ali Carter. I think Jack Jones has actually done really well to qualify. Um, mm. Well, he beat Barry Hawkins, didn't he? Yeah, which isn't you know, and that's a massive shock. I mean, had Barry Hawkins come out of the the hat against Ali Carter, you might have thought differently mm-hmm. about who was going through. So. Yeah, I mean Jack Jones clearly in good form. He'll he's got nothing to lose, and I think that's a that's a big thing. And actually, he's much higher up the rankings than I ever thought he was. He's number forty four in the world. Um, a couple of victories, you know, at the at the Crucible, and he he could well find himself into the top thirty two. So, um, I do think yeah, I think Jack Jones would have had a chance against some of the seeds. I might have fancied him against a Bingham or. Maybe even against the Higgins this season, but I just think Carter's actually had a really, really good season, hasn't he? So, you know, yeah. I just fancy him to beat him. And I think he'll be up for it, you know. I think Carter will also look at his half of the draw and think he's got a chance of getting to the semi finals, to be quite honest with you. So, yeah, well, the uh, the next match, their opponent will be Neil Robertson or Wu Yizza. Um, Wu, I believe, is 19. I think he's the, the youngest player in the draw. Mr. Mullet, isn't he? Mr. Mullet. In- <laughs> Although I think I really he has shaved his, it off now. I really hope that'll be his nickname. I think he shaved it off, Tom. I Why? Think, I think genuinely. I think I've seen him in the last qualifying match. I can't remember who he was playing now, but um, yeah, I think he shaved it off. Oh, that's heartbreaking news. I might be wrong. I might be wrong. Well, I hope he loses um, ten 0 now without his mullet. Because I remember, th- I, I remember thinking, "Oh, he's shaved his mullet off," I, I, and I'm sure it must have been him that I was watching. But uh, Wait, did he, you watch; he'll he'll have a full on mullet. Did he shave but, it off uh, during the match? <laughs> yeah. Well, that's what Roddy did yeah, against course. Cahill, famously, yeah. didn't he? Yeah. Um, so that might be a sign. <laughs> you know what? This is going to be a controversial one. I have backed Wu Yize to beat Neil Robertson. Well, Neil has had a pretty poor season. <laughs> you can say that again. I mean, he's, he's... Neil has had a pretty poor season. <laughs> he's uh, a but amazingly still, you know, top four in the world. Come the end of the season, you know, went out in round two of the Welsh Open at Dominic Dale. Um, Lost in the first round of the World Grand Prix. Lost in the uh, fourth round of the German Masters. Um, I mean, to be fair, though, this whole section of the draw, when you, know, when you look at it, Mark Allen, Fang Zheng Yi, Stuart Bigham, David Gilbert, Ali Carter, Jack Jones, Neil Robertson, Wu Yizza, and one of them is going to make the semi-finals. Yeah. I think all of them would see it as, I've got a shot here. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I th- I've backed Wu just because Neil, uh, he's got a horrible recent Crucible record, hasn't he? Um, Generally not in the first round, but, you know, we'll see. Um, I mean, if Neil Robertson gets through the first round, he's got a genuine chance of winning the tournament, in my opinion. Um, 
but I don't know. Uh, he, again, he's not been convincing this season. There's always one huge seed to go out in round one, and I think Neil Robertson is the one this time. It's a big, it's a big one. It uh, certainly ramps up my uh, traditional round one accumulator <laughs> uh, when I when I put in woo for that. But uh, yeah, I'm going to go Neil, mate. I'm going for Neil. I think I have to. I have to back him because. <laughs> Just his experience. Wu is a unknown quantity on the big stage, as it were. But you know what? Wu Wu is actually uh, ranked at number fifty, and I believe he's on his first first year of the tour card, isn't he? Or is he is he on his second now? Um, no, it, might, it must be second, surely. Otherwise, he would have had an incredible season. I don't know. Uh, let's have a look. Oh yeah, he did. He he played in. I think him and 21. him and Pang are on their second year. Right. Okay. Um, but yeah. Who knows, hey? Who knows? Who knows? But I mean, you know, it, it it is these days. It's a remarkable achievement to get into the top sixty-four in your two years, and he's at number fifty now. The only way, really, for him to go is is up the rankings. Yeah. I think. I think once you've got into the top sixty-four, it's very doable to to keep going because you've got that two-year rollover of money. Yeah. Um. So, yeah, we'll see. We'll see. It, it's definitely a success for him to just qualify for the Crucible. So, yeah. again, a player with nothing to, to lose, particularly. And, uh, yeah, I mean, that could help him. He could be... You, you might be right, mate. He could play with complete freedom and just go, let's go for it. And I'm surprised, Neil. I wouldn't be... Yeah. I, that wouldn't be as much, as big a shock as some people would predict, I would say. Mm-hmm. Um, this next match fairly... I'd say fairly well matched Kyron Wilson against Ryan Day. Yes, I, you know I'd normally agree with that. I, I'm not. I'm not convinced by Ryan Day's form going into it. Um, obviously, he had the walkover in the final round of qualifying. Yeah. Um, was four 0 up anyway, you know. But he played. I think it was Ashley Hugel in the in the penultimate round, and that was a horrible match. It was. It, it was honestly. It was poor standard so and Ryan Day actually um had a interview with Rob Walker mm. after that match and I don't know if, if you've seen it but um he talked about if he was having another season of bits and bobs of good form then it, next season's probably going to be his last I can't is what believe he said that. I'm, I get so annoyed by players who are basically just outside the top 16 going oh i might retire it's like mate you're, you're not playing that badly <laughs> yeah i think you know i think it, it there's a lot of players that are quite disillusioned with the sport and the tour and the tournaments that we we've got on it there's been a lot of controversy actually um did you not enjoy the wst classic but well yeah but um I don't know if you've seen, but they they put up the uh, the the schedule for next season or something outside the Crucible somewhere, and um and on it it had that the shootout was going to be played at Swansea when they had previously announced that it was going to be played in Leicester again next year. So people are very confused as to what what's going on. The players apparently have not found out anything, um, and WST have just put that uh, out in the in Crucible Square and um, for the public to see before any of the players have seen. And apparently there's going to be multiple tournaments before Christmas in China as well that the players haven't found out about. So, yeah, it's I can see why people like Ryan Deere are a bit like... And they've probably earned enough of a living from Snooker to be comfortable for a decent amount of time, yeah. you know. I get it, if I'm honest. Um, so yeah, that's a long way of saying Kyron Wilson. He was immense. Uh, <laughs> he was immense at the Tour Championship, mm. and I think it just came up against the one player that played better that week, and that was Sean Murphy. So, but uh, I think Kyron obviously is due a massive tournament victory at some point, and maybe this could be the year i know you know his his family have have had a lot of issues um one of his sons has you know been in hospital quite a lot 
or since the turn of the year. And that tends to spur on players more than you think. You know, I mean, John Higgins obviously won the world title not long after his dad died. Um, you know, there's lots of... You know, Mark Selby has played quite well this season after, you know, his well-documented troubles last year. So You're going for the, th- the Hollywood script for this, are you? Not necessarily. It's just... A pattern, really, that I've noticed. When something's going on outside, I think it helps you zone in on your snooker. And I think over the long format, Kyron is definitely a force to be reckoned with. Yeah, I think I'd, I'd go with uh, Kyron. Um, now, the next match is John Higgins against David Grace. <laughs> and I... This could be the poorest standard match of the entire 16 matches. Just on John Higgins's form. I mean, I'm tempted to go for David Grace, and that's a sentence I did not think I was going to say at the start of the season. <laughs> no, I mean, John, again, he's a player that either goes out in the first round or tends to have a decent run at the World Championships. Again, is a player that is defending ranking points um, going into it. You know, he's scheduled to, to be number 11 come the end of the season. Obviously, next year, he's got a hundred grand coming off for uh, for the world championship, and it, and if that was to to happen right now, he would actually pretty much drop out of the top sixteen, depending on wow. other players' performances around that. But he's the only one of the class of ninety two that that hasn't dropped out of the top sixteen yet in his career. So. But he's had a very bad season, considering last year he, he had five ranking event finals. Mm-hmm. Obviously lost them all, but... Maybe that left scars. Yeah, and I think he did talk about it in the summer. You know, he talked about how it was one of his toughest seasons ever because he lost so many tournaments from winning positions as well. Mm-hmm. Um, then obviously lost against Ronnie in the semi-final. He didn't play particularly well against Ronnie. It was a massively hyped match and... Ronnie won it very comfortably in the end, yeah. which you would never normally say about Ronnie against John Higgins. Yeah. He never seems to do that. So, um, yeah, and I, I know he came out of last season very deflated, and it seems like he's had a a real struggle this year. Oh no, Joe! He just went to a lot of spin classes. That's all it was. <laughs> yeah. Oh, well, exactly. Maybe that's what it is. Mm. Maybe that's what it is. Who knows? But. I mean, his one-year performance is uh, is is quite shocking, to be honest. So, I'm trying to find him on the one-year list. This is this is difficult work. <laughs> uh, Stu Bingham, number thirty-nine on the one-year list. John Higgins, number fifty-four wow, on the hey. one-year list, going into it. David Grace is probably above him. He is. David Grace is number forty. So on season form, David Grace should actually be the favourite for this match. Right, I'm going to go for him. Amazing Grace, I'm, I, I call him. I've got John Higgins. <laughs> Yeah, I'd love to see John Higgins get back to form. He is one of the players that, you know, plays proper snooker. Yeah. On to the penultimate match of the first round, and it's uh, it's a local derby. I should be really pleased about this matchup, shouldn't I? Um, I was leaving it to you to introduce it. I thought this was your yeah. basically a home match for you, isn't it? You've <laughs> you've got. Uh, the Tyneside Terror, um, Gary Wilson against some guy called Elliot Slass. I never heard of him. <laughs> but uh, no, I mean, you know, to be fair, I watched, I watched quite a bit of Elliot Slesser in the qualifying and he, and he is playing well. Um, For those who don't know, when Joe was about <laughs> 10 or something, Elliot Slesser beat him in a snooker tournament and Joe has not forgiven him since. No, I, I actually I was thirteen. He was sixteen. He was, you know, a bit older than me. Um, we were playing in a in a Riley's Ronnie O'Sullivan Future Stars event or something, um, which I, I've tried to look into um, a little bit. I, I know I, I showed that to Tom uh, off camera, but yeah, Elliot beat me in the final of the the local heat in Sunderland. 
in uh, 2011 that was so that was a a reasonable time ago but some players in the final of that the the, the overall finals of that event well some like the Lincolnshire sausage uh, Stephen <laughs> Hallworth he was in there um there was there was quite a few players that are seen in there that uh, Jamie Clark won it actually mm-hmm. Jamie Clark won that event um so you know all all the best to Elliot Slesser I know I know he's um he's played at the Crucible before he did all right actually um but but went out in the first round and I, I think it's it's going to be a very close match I think Gary Wilson must be on cloud nine how he how he's got through the crucible as a qualifier as a seed you know I mean that's ridiculous really yeah the first time um, he's done that as well yeah absolutely I mean he won his first tournament earlier this season and um I do I do think Elliot Slesser uh, can give him can give him a good match, and you know if he becomes world champion, then I can say I was beaten by a world champion. There you go. Oh, I hope that happens now. <laughs> but uh, you know we'll we'll see how it goes, and um, it could be again a, a bit of a a Shredsville match. Um, if I'm honest, and and Elliot Sless has not had a great season, to be fair. So I, I would be quite I, I, I was quite surprised that he qualified. If I'm honest, but I know you uh, you backed him, <laughs> you backed him all the way. Yeah, didn't you? well, I'm, I might back him to beat Gary Wilson, to be honest, because um, that's the thing about just to see the look on my face. Pretty much, hey? yeah. I just want to make you yeah. happy, Joe. That's all it is. <laughs> yes, of course. But no, it's, I mean it's good to see two players from the northeast playing. And uh, speaking of the northeast, I have been spend a few days there. Um, recently was at the South Shield Stuker Centre today, mm-hmm. playing on the usual table too. That's where I've played at for years. Um, knocked in a thirty-four break in the first frame. That was a good, good start. Oh, yes. And who was on table one? But none other than David Lilly. Oh, mate! The the owner, um, well, the manager of South Shield Snooker Centre, and uh, he was there with his presumably son. I'm guessing, but. Um, seemed to be a relative anyway. He was coaching his his son, um, or relative, I should say, because I, I I don't know if, I don't know David personally. So, not but, yet, uh, yeah. but if you keep there practicing, there you go. Me. Not yet. Well, yes, yeah, yeah. But uh, he was probably trying to get some tips from me, you know. Uh, yeah. Maybe if he'd watched me a week earlier, he might, he might not have been there. He might have been at the Crucible. Who knows? <laughs> but. Uh, yeah, but there you go. Fun fact of the day: northeast part of the podcast over. But uh, I've backed Gary Wilson to win that one. Mm-hmm. Probably ten nine, ten eight, something like that. I know they're good friends. They're actually good friends. So yeah, it was one of. I about, think that'll be a tough match. It was one of about four draws where um, Rob Walker went. Oh, they're best friends, and it's like, are they? Rob? Yeah. Are they all really best friends? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and then uh, last but not least, um, what could be. The slowest match of the first round. We've got Mark Selby, Jester from Leicester, yep. against Matthew Selt, who both who are known for their defensive skills on a snooker table. I mean, you know, I think that is a harsh description of Mark Selby. I actually think it's lazy j- journalism, as uh, Sean <laughs> Murphy would put it. But, um, you know, Mark Selby... Seemingly back on form, I think is is going to have a very good tournament. Probably, lots of people backing him to win it. Not sure about that, but we'll see. Um, and Matthew Selt, I don't know, bit of a journeyman pro for me, mm. if I'm honest. But probably will come out of the blue in the next year up to eighteen months and win the Gibraltar Open or something, and will end up inevitably in the top sixteen. When there's only sixteen players left, he's won a ranking title, isn't he? Oh, he did he win the he won the did he win the Indian Open? Yeah, what is that? Weird, he won? Like smaller ranking events, I think. Um, right. So he has won a ranking, which again, he's one of those you go like, what really? You don't really think of them as that level of player. He's kind of very much a mid tier yeah. player. Um, I can't really see past Selby there. No, I've I've got to agree with that. You know, Selby is. Has had a decent season. Had he, you know, won the decider against Sean Murphy, he'd have been world number one going into the tournament. Actually, will drop to number ten at the end of the, this 
tournament unless he wins it. So, you know, a little bit of pressure riding on that. But, um, you know, if he does win it, or, or if Ronnie wins it, you know, e- either of them, it's, it's very much the, the Selby and O'Sullivan era, isn't it, of mm-hmm. the World Championships. It's been, uh, you know, since 2012, um, we've only had Stuart Bingham and, and Judd Trump uh, and Mark Williams are different to yeah, Selby or O'Sullivan. Think, so, it? yeah, but, uh, yeah, I've, I mean, I've backed Mark Selby and I think he'll win it quite comfortably, actually. But if it goes tight, um, I don't know if they're playing an evening session for their <laughs> final session, but uh, if they're not, then they'll probably be on the, the table <laughs> at the end of the day because yeah. I'm not sure they'll finish in the allotted time. Uh, I, I think Mark Selby... T- plays a little bit later on in the tournament doesn't he I think it's uh Wednesday and Thursday for him so yeah which might work out quite nicely for him it reduces what we call this 17 day marathon into a you know 13 or 14 day marathon which is still long but it makes a big difference I think starting your, your journey that late yeah I'd agree but um there are our predictions everyone and we've made it yes. on for the scenes uh I would say yeah but I mean, generally. generally, that is the way it, it works out. I mean, as, as you said, yeah. like, it's it's been a long time since it, it was not either the Selby or the Ronnie show at the Crucible. Um, like the last time I think there was a final with two players who'd never won it before, I think it might have been Graham Dot against Ebden, possibly, or something like that. No, Ebden had won it before. Oh, it must. It, it, it was Murphy versus Stevens in all 05. Oh, I knew it was around that time period. Yeah, yeah a long time since we, we had that situation. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, yeah, yeah. The, you know, yeah. The, the top 16 tend to manage to find their way to the later stages. It just happens. And, and, and generally, you know, the finals do consist of two players that have won it before. Yeah. Generally, you know, it, it's it's very rare that you do get players in there that um you know haven't at least been in the final before so yeah it, it's it, it's going to be a great 17 days i think i've predicted five players to uh or five seeds to to drop out of the the first round and just to um finish off the sort of prediction side of it um every year i i go on to sky bet or other betting companies are available if you choose to do that um and I put in a I put an accumulator on uh, for the first round and a predict like I we've just done there and um, do a sixteen fold accumulator mm. which for me this time was three thousand one hundred and seventy one to one so uh, with all of those players wow. so uh, with a three pound forty bet that would but give me a potential return of ten thousand seven hundred and eighty five pounds if. All of my predictions come true. I think the closest I got was fourteen out of sixteen one year. But I mean, if Joe wins that, that is enough for Joe <laughs> to get a recording studio and record the hit <laughs> single "Where's the Cue Ball Going." Um, well, yes, yes. But he also true. needs this video to get fifteen thousand views. So you know, share it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's it's a bit of pressure actually because I think it will get fifty thousand <laughs> views on the look of of how your video did earlier today. But um, yeah, no, it'll be it'll be a good tournament, and looking forward to making the pilgrimage myself down um, next Saturday. So uh, again, if you are in the area next Saturday, please let me know so I, I know where to avoid you. But uh, yeah, uh, so. so just on the on the betting front, we we don't want to talk about it too much, but there are some quite hilarious um, requester bets, is what they're called on on Skybet, um, and these are, are called in quotations popular requester bets. So uh, here's the first one for you, Tom, and this is two thousand five hundred to one. Okay, John Higgins, Sean Murphy, and Ronnie O'Sullivan to make a one four seven break each in the tournament. Does that mean literally one person has bet on that? Because like that's not going to happen, is it? <laughs> no, I think I, I honestly I think they just make it up. Um, Two hundred to one, right? Mm-hmm. This sounds reasonable until you hear the second bit. Any English winner and three plus one four seven breaks in the tournament. Okay. 
have these people ever seen snooker? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the most we had was two. That yep. was 2008 with Ronnie and, and Ali. Um, and and we've had, you know, decades of world championships. So why, why yeah, would this yeah, year yeah. be the year to break it? Yeah. Um, I mean, this this one is is a reasonable one. Forty to one. Ronnie O'Sullivan, Judd Trump, Neil Robertson, and Mark Selby all to win their quarter. I mean, it'd be a reasonable one if you were playing snooker nineteen or something. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it, true. I think in real true. life it just doesn't doesn't happen like that, does it? I mean, this one's quite ridiculous. Any qualifier to win the tournament? What do you think the odds are for that? Any qualifier to win the tournament? A thousand to one. Nine to one. Nine to That's one. That's awful odds. <laughs> what? Why would you even bother? <laughs> Any first round match to finish at ten nil. Hundred to one. Seven to one. Genuinely, genuinely. And uh, do you reckon you can name the top five favourites for the tournament? Ronnie O'Sullivan. Yeah. Mark Adam. Nope. <laughs> what? Oh, sorry. What? That was my second most confident answer. <laughs> yeah. Okay, Judd Trump. Yep. Mark, Number three. Mark Selby. Number two. Um, Mark Williams. Uh, number nine on the list. Oh my god. Okay, Neil Robertson. Yes. Number four. Um, I'm just trying to think who's in the top five of the rankings. They probably just. But then Adam second in the rankings, so I don't really get it. Um. Sean Murphy. Yeah, number five. And now, do you reckon you can do the five longest odds to win the World Championship? Oh, OK. Um, Jack Jones. Yes, he's the third at uh, 150 to one. Uh, Pang, probably just because he's playing Ronnie. You will not believe this. He's actually reasonably mid-table, 100 to one. You can't make Ronnie the favourite then have Pang in. <laughs> that makes no sense. <laughs> um, <sighs> Wu? Yes, he's the fourth longest odds at 100 to 1. Uh, C? Yep, yeah, fifth. Just because I presume at they're all going to be debutantes, to be honest. Um, even though I think that would be unfair on fan, but is is he? Is no David Grace? I presume. Yeah, David Grace is three hundred to one. That's uh, two, the second longest odds. Uh, is there one more? There's one more, and he he is the longest odds of the lot. Really? Or equal longest odds? Yeah. Um, Mark King. <laughs> No, he would bet on that, but <laughs> it's it's not it's not it's not him. Is it Matthew Selt? It's not actually. It's Elliot Slesser. That is very unfair for poor old Slesser. Yeah. <laughs> He's not even the lowest yeah. ranked player. He's in the top sixty-four. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. It is. It is very harsh, isn't it? Right, yeah. So if you want to go place a bet on someone, place a quid on Slesser. <laughs> see what happens. Well, yeah. Joe will be quid doing each it, way. Won't you, Joe? Yeah. Well, yeah. If, if I, if I had the ten thousand in me account potentially, <laughs> you know, maybe I'd put it all on Elliot Slesser <laughs> to win. <laughs> oh, all of a sudden, three million that I've made there. There you go, three hundred to one he is, three hundred to one. And he's also weirdly the longest odds to make the highest break, which is an odd one. Like he's by far the longest odds to make the highest break, two hundred and twenty-five to one. <laughs> David Grace is at 175. Most other players are at 100 or less to make the highest break. It's bizarre. What Somebody's really got in for Elliot Slesser on Skybet. And it's not you. You don't run this, and web- it's not you don't me. Run this website, do you, Joe? I do not run this website. No. Uh, speaking of predictions, mm-hmm. uh, both Tom and I did try and predict the 16 qualifiers for the, the World Championship. Yep. Now, um, I think we both have varying successes on that. Yeah. Uh, and actually, you know, most of the players that qualified, you were on paper the players that should have qualified. So, 
Um, that's quite interesting. So, go on, Tom. How many did you get? Well, I got Ryan Day, Elliot Slesser, and Fan Zheng Yi, and I believe that's all I've got. I only got three. How many did you get? Well, I got Ryan Day. Mm-hmm. I also had uh, Dominic Dale. To, to win and Alan Taylor so you know I didn't have much of a chance I mean that's the thing some of mine I predicted I predicted Graham Dot who got to the last day I predicted Graham Dot uh, Graham Dot I predicted uh, Anthony Hamilton who got to the final day so I yeah. you know I don't think I was far you were unlucky yeah I got Ryan Day Nopon and Ricky Walden so we both got three Nice. Well, I mean, but that... between us, we got five. <laughs> that's not bad, is it, really? Five out of five not... sixteen, I think. Yeah, um, that's not bad. We did the predictions at the start of the qualifiers. We didn't do it on the yeah. final day, so I think... no, no, no. Yeah, yeah. Right at the start. I mean, the, you know, some of the ones that uh, got the final day for me: Barry Hawkins, um, Matthew Stevens, uh, Jackson Page, Liam Highfield got very close. Um. Andy Hicks, I think, got fairly close. I think he may have got the second, uh, the penultimate match. Yeah. And Dominic Dale as well. That seemed to do Dom. all right. So, good old Dom. Yeah, I mean, for a moment when I when I seen Taylor on my list, I was like, I surely didn't predict Dennis to qualify, did I? <laughs> but... <laughs> Dennis Taylor. Yeah. I've been imagining. But I, I, you know, I remember. I remember. It was years and years ago. It was. Um, it wasn't long after Barry Hearn took over the sport, and I think he he made the world qualifiers three matches best of 19. I don't know if you remember that. Everybody had to play three best of 19 matches. Okay. And, uh, and he said all former world champions would be invited to play at the world championship. And I remember they interviewed all sorts of... Past champions like Cliff Thorburn, he said he was going to give it a go, and and Dennis said he was going to get the old queue out and give it a go. But I've I've never I've never seen anybody um, former world champion playing it that isn't on the tour. So it, oh, Hendry, it was very Hendry odd. Back. Hendry came back, but um, but yeah, it would be really cool. And I, I know John Parrott um, used to enter for quite a few years after he retired. In the first qualifying round, but I'd, I'd I'd quite like to see it. I think um, you know, it, it's good for the game to have a link to its past. And realistically, there aren't that many former world champions, so you're not giving up too many spaces that are still alive. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, good old Ray Reardon if he turns up, and uh, you know, you know. I mean, I have seen him play a few shots um, in recent years, and he still looks all right, to be honest with you. I'd love to see him on the seniors tour. But the worry is, oh. Joe, you know, if we're talking about, let, let's say, Cliff Auburn against Dennis Taylor, best of 19. <laughs> how many days you set aside for that match? <laughs> yeah, I mean, be that, than, might, that... that might genuinely take longer than the Snooker 19 virtual World Championship final. <laughs> And that took a while. Oh, Me and Chinny were... I mean, his chin was on the floor <laughs> at the end of that match. I was going to say it would take longer than the whole World Championship. <laughs> yeah, yeah the, uh, it's, uh, we're round at the next World Championship by the time they've <laughs> finished the first frame. Yeah, De- um, Dennis going, oh, you thought the, uh, the finish in 85 was late? We'll see this one, guys. <laughs> yeah, and they just deliberately make the pockets... The tightest they've ever been, so <laughs> they can they can never part anything. But uh, that would be cool to see. I mean, of course, most of them would do worse than Hendry did this time. So, hmm. and I guess that's why it's not a thing. It was it's a good idea until it's not, <laughs> basically, until it's not. But uh, yeah, that's an interesting one. Boom boom. Right, well, shall we go on to our one of our regular sections? Shall we go on to cue the music? 
Cue the music. Oh, I'm looking forward to this. Which, for, for new listeners, basically this is a section where we get a, a piece of music that is connected to snooker in some way. We have a listen to it, and we, we give it a review. So in the past, we've done Peter Ebden singing Career. We've done Dennis Taylor singing Snooker Loopy. We've done... Um, what else have we done? Stephen Hendry as Rubbish. We did a whole episode about him. <laughs> Yeah, I, I think some people took offence to uh, the title of that video. It was just Stephen Hendry is rubbish. Hey, yeah. you've got plenty of likes on YouTube, mate. It's fine. Well, they, there you go. There you go. But this episode, because it's the uh, the World Championship, quite a special episode. We thought we'd we'd look at the uh, the song that inspired this this podcast title, the name of this podcast. Uh, of course, Snooker Loopy. I'll put in a, a short clip here. It'll probably be a, a shorter clip than usual because I don't want to get a copyright thing on the YouTube video. So I think you can put about 15 seconds. Is that right? Oh, I wouldn't even risk that, Tom. <laughs> okay, what I might do in the, in the podcast, I'll just give you uh, Dennis Taylor singing Snooker Loopy again and then we'll <laughs> talk about the actual song. Yeah. I think that's fair enough. A loopy. I know you're snooker loopy nuts, so here we go. I might as well, rather than just talking, I might as well try and sing it. So, uh, snooker loopy nuts are we, me and him and them and me. We'll show you what we can do with a load of balls and a snooker cue. Pot the red, then screw back for the yellow, green, brown, blue, pink and black. Snooker loopy nuts are we, we're all snooker loopy. Bum, bum, bum. So this is a song that people don't know. I think it was in about 1986. Uh, and it's got Chaz and Dave. And it's got uh, professional players at the time. Steve Davis, Dennis Taylor, Willie Fawn, Terry Griffiths and Tony Mayo as backing vocalists. Well, there you go. I mean, can you imagine them singing about... And there's Stuart Bingham. <laughs> a Bingham would definitely be involved in this, wouldn't he? <laughs> In a 2023 remake, he would be. Well, he has recorded... Um, it, it was a, a snooker charity song, wasn't he? During yeah. the, uh, the pandemic. Yeah. Oh, God. <laughs> that, oh, God. That'll be a future episode of Cued Music, definitely. <laughs> it's like a knockoff band-aid, isn't it? <laughs> a much lower budget version. <laughs> Because they're even doing the whole holding the, the headphone kind of band-aid thing, aren't they? <laughs> Do they know it's Snooker Loopy at all? Do they know it's Crucible Eve at all? <laughs> oh, Snooker Loopy, ba-dum-bum, ba-dum-bum. 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 Or, as Dennis says. I don't know why, but I liked it. Ba-dum-bum, ba-dum-bum. Right, so there we go, Joe. That was the uh, that Snooker Loopy. Yes. What are your your thoughts, your opinions? How do you feel? How does that music make you feel in your heart? Yeah, you know what? I, I I think it is just a very cheerful song. I think I think it you know it describes snooker as well. You know, and I, I think that that's something really special. Actually, um, you know, it's a time capsule of what snooker was like in the eighties. Some classic players in there. Lots who are world champions. Um, Players who are happy to laugh at themselves, which I think yeah, is really nice absolutely. to see. Absolutely. Yeah, you know, I think I think it, it is just, um, you know, a timeless bit of snooker history in there. And I, I, just, I just think it, it really captures the 80s. It captures the spirit of snooker at that time. And... Um, you know what? It, it it actually was a joy to to watch that again. You know, it's quite a while since I've watched the video in full. And I know you said you didn't think you'd seen it before. Well, I don't know whether I I would have sat down and act, actively watched it or just seen clips of it on telly or something. But um, you know, it's nice. It, it's nice to see them. You know, clearly they had a fun time recording it. Um, clearly, they all enjoyed their status in the game at that point um they didn't mind the, the little jokes about each other like you know willie fawn and his 
chopping his bald head and stuff like that. They they sort of all played along with that, which is really nice to see. Um, I just think, you know, the matchroom mob in general, you know, they would go around, they would play exhibitions. You just don't get that anymore, really. You, you obviously get Ronnie doing quite a few exhibitions with Jimmy, but you don't really have... You know, you don't have Judd Trump going around the country playing with Stu Bingham in exhibitions. You know, and I think that that's a shame. Yeah, actually. well, I think they could do because there is there was a company called Snooker Legends, I think, at some point. Uh, there still is, yeah. Well, I don't know why they don't do a you know a snooker champions exhibition kind of thing. Where... Yeah, I mean, they did they did one with uh, it was Ronnie Jimmy. Stephen Hendry and Rianne Evans. Um, I think they did a couple with those, but um, they called it like the Liverpool Masters or something, you know. But I, I do think we need more of that, and I think going in, players going into clubs and talking to people that would be great. I think they just, I think they just think themselves as. That celebrity, like Judd and Jack, will just go off to Dubai for mm. three weeks instead of, you know, engaging in a- exhibitions and whatever during those six weeks when there's not tournaments, and it would just be it would keep that momentum of the snooker season up, in my opinion. But that's a debate for another day. Um, rating time for Snooker Loopy, and I think we have to be a bit biased here because yeah, it, yeah. it is. If it wasn't for this song, then this podcast might not exist. Yeah, that's very true. No, no one would have used the phrase "snooker loopy" without this song. It wasn't a phrase beforehand, surely. <laughs> there wasn't. You know, it wasn't like you know someone watching the nineteen eighty five final going, "Oh my god, this is snooker loopy!" What I'm watching. <laughs> I think people would have maybe been calling us loopy if we were saying snooker loopy. So, <laughs> yeah. Uh, I mean, go on. You go first for once. Once. Okay, well, I'm. I mean, I'm going to give it a ten, just because I yeah. think, um, you know, it's it. As you say, it encapsulates a time period. It, it really captures that mid '80s boom of snooker. It's got, you know, a lot of the the big players in the game. Um, it's not got all the big players in the game, and there was actually a a rival single released at the same time, which we will talk about in a future episode of the podcast for Cue the Music that featured the likes of. Hurricane Higgins and other notable names who were upset at not being involved. So we'll talk about that at a, a slightly later podcast. But in terms of you know the the you know the world champion, the um, the player that lost in the, the final the year before, you know Dennis and Steve were both there, and it's just great. I just think it's a really really nice sort of celebration of snooker, and it's not trying to be cool. Which Nuka shouldn't do because it's not. Yeah, it's not cool. It's quite niche. It's quite unique, and it embraced mm. that in a really lovely way. Mm. Absolutely, yeah. Uh, it, it's a ten from me as well. I think it is. It is the uh, uh, ultimate Snooker song, isn't it? And I'm surprised it doesn't get played more around Crucible time. Well, I feel like it always will pop up most years as part of some sort of piece they do on the BBC um, purely because how many snooker songs could they possibly have so it does it does pop yeah. up but I do feel like it's um... yeah and I don't know whether you'll keep this bit in the, the podcast from when we talked about it but uh, we, we, we called it the the snooker version of Band-Aid yeah. <laughs> so, it yeah. is well, that's, what, that's why I wish there was a snooker loopy 2000 at a snooker loopy 2020 do you know what i mean they yeah. should keep yeah, yeah, re-recording yeah. it with new players because yeah yeah i would yeah. buy it people would buy that i would do another version yeah. with... for the for one of their um children's hospices that they they work with it would be i think it would be a really nice idea yeah. maybe we should bring it back tom maybe we should maybe we should as you know, we are immortalizing Snooker Loopy with this podcast. We should potentially go out there, contact all these players, and form it up. 
will be the new Bob Geldofs of this world. <laughs> About time, about time. About time. Snooker, Bob Gilder. Why not? Absolutely. We'll try our best, all right? (laughs) So that was Cue the Music, and (laughs) make sure you tune in to the next one to uh, find out what uh, what other rubbish we can muster up (laughs) from Snooker's past. We've had uh, Stephen Hendry, we've had Peter Rebden, obviously. (laughs) But uh, that's the best so far. And, Snook- and the second version of Snooker Loopy. I mean, how many versions of Snooker Loopy are we going to manage to fit in to cue the music? <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully a thousand. <laughs> oh, dear. Ba-dum, ba-dum. Speaking of rubbish from Snooker's past, and this does, again, because it's the, the World Championship, I wanted to get something that kind of harked back to that era, similar to snooker loopy the song so we've got our other regular section which is cue the laughter whereas which for new listeners is basically me and joe we find uh one of us will find a bit of a obscure or slightly weird bit of snooker (laughs) memorabilia and we'll we'll bring it to the podcast so we've had uh, i think we've been very successful at finding these odd things you know stephen hendry action figure is (laughs) has got to be up there you know, last last time we had the um, the player descriptions from the World Snooker um, 2002 game mm-hmm. manual, um, which was hilarious as well. So we, we've had Kellogg's, Dennis Taylor, and <laughs> and Stephen Hendry mm-hmm. as well. So it, it it has been really good. Um, so do do check it out. Well, what I have for you this time, Joe, and I'll I'll send you. I'm excited. Uh, the link. Is that, it's, oh god! It's a link of something that's currently on eBay. Um, oh no, not again! It's not something I own, but it's something that I, I wish I owned because it's it's something that I'm gonna own soon. I'm sure. Well, me and Joe might get into a, a bidding war over this. <laughs> a bidding war. Oh god! Here we go. Oh, vintage. Let's have a look at this. Bidding has ended on this item. I think they might. I think they'll relist it, so we can, oh. we can start the bidding war by talking about it on the podcast. Oh my goodness me! Well, luckily for me, I don't have any single beds in the house. <laughs> you will after you buy this, Joe, because um... <laughs> well, I might have beds with only one person in it. Yeah, yeah, that's true. This item is, uh, and I will probably do a, a video edition of this clip later on in in the month just so people can see the photos of this but this is a officially licensed matchroom <laughs> licensed by matchroom it's got their their logo on it and it's a a licensed um bedding duvet and pillowcase cover which looks like on your bed like it's a snooker table it's <laughs> got the pillow has got like little snooker balls and it's got uh, like the signatures of, of the likes of Dennis Taylor and Steve Davis and Jimmy White. It's uh, it's an incredible s- snapshot. I mean, if of... you ever wanted Steve Davis's balls on your bed, then uh... <laughs> <laughs> that was your chance. <laughs> Dreams can come true. <laughs> Yes, that's going to be another edition of the uh, X-rated Snooker Extra at 11 o'clock on BBC Two. I was trying to think <laughs> which snooker player would own this duvet, and I've just, <laughs> I just had an image of it being... I know exactly who I think would own it, but... Go on, who are you going to say? I think Stuart Bingham, to be honest with you. <laughs> yes, I was going to say definitely. I was going to say either Stuart Bingham... Or Sean Murphy. <laughs> and then they I had think, well, an image of them both <laughs> under the covers, like fighting over oh the God. covers, going, no, give me the covers. Yeah, they thought the 2015 World Final was for the the World Championship trophy, but actually it was for this. <laughs> <laughs> so that means Stuart Bingham must own it. I mean, I, I would love to see him wearing it. Like like Mark Williams wore the... Uh, <laughs> the the Betfred... Um, Town. The things that happened on a twelve by six. <laughs> <laughs> wow! But I think it's 
a Kraken item. Like, if I was a kid... <laughs> There's one thing I want to ask, Tom. Yep. How on earth did you find this? Um... <laughs> well... <laughs> <laughs> I was typing in Steve Davis's balls. <laughs> Were you actually? <laughs> no. <laughs> it was not what I was expecting to come up on Google Images, I'll say that. Yeah. Um... <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> oh, dear. No, I, I, I think I, I went on eBay and I typed in... Um, just snooker 80s because then I knew it would come up with some kind of retro memorabilia and uh, I, browsed few, I browsed through a few pages and it was mainly sort of books or or videos and then I was like, oh, snooker bedding, oh, I can get Jimmy White's balls on my pillow as well Oh god What, what other players' balls are on your pillow? Let's have a look Dennis Taylor Willie Ford on, Willie, Willie Ford on your uh, pillow, Dennis Taylor Oh Oh, Neil Folds. Ooh. Oh well, that's a bit of an out there one, isn't it? There we go. Who's oh, got the blue Christ. balls? The blue ball, I mean, on this. I can't see it. I might have to buy it. To... <laughs> no, don't buy it, Tom. Don't buy it. You don't need it. No, we should buy it and send it as to a bigger <laughs> person. Well, Joe, all I'm saying is one of us is going to the Crucible. So one of us can, and one of us could take... could well be seeing St- <laughs> Stuart Bingham on that day. One of us is you can take it to him, give it to him oh, as he comes God. out. Oh <laughs> God! It'll be relisted. <laughs> I, w- I want to see the description for it. Uh, oh, it's quite disappointing actually. It just says vintage uh, Horrocks's matchroom snooker single duvet cover and pillowcase eighties. There you go. I did have a look, and and some of these have sold for like 30, I mean, thirty quid. The the name of this guy is Hurricane Hurricanes Burwat, so maybe he's a snooker fan, or she I could should, be a I she. I should check what else they're. Uh, I'll keep an eye on them and see if they list anything else that's interesting. <laughs> Style vintage slash retro room bedroom. I mean, it's a cracking wow. item. I, I'm, I, I'd be tempted to buy it for fifteen quid. I mean, oh, that's insane, isn't it? But Joe, we're I mean, gonna, it's a one-off. We're, we're going to have to chat so we don't end up both in a bidding war. Well, one of us goes, you're welcome to it, Tom. One of us goes. To be honest with you, one of us goes. I paid eighty quid for it, and the other one went. Oh yeah, I tried to win it, and it was you who bidded fifty-nine quid. <laughs> or something stupid like that. Yeah. Yeah. I can't believe Neil Folds is on it. But how would you feel, Joe, if you were on a, a date with someone of of, <laughs> of any gender? It's kind of irrelevant. But you're on a lovely date. It's your, I know in real life you've got a partner, but in this hypothetical, <laughs> in this snooker loopy universe, you're you're a single man. You're on a, you're on a lovely date, beautiful. <laughs> you chatted about, oh, this person likes snooker. I can't believe they like snooker as well. This is amazing. And then you get back to their place, and that is their bedding. How would you feel? Uh, well, I mean, I'd feel mesmerised by looking at Steve Davis's balls, to be honest with you. But <laughs> it's not—it's not what I'd expect to see at the end of a date, <laughs> if I'm honest. Unless, of course, the person I was on a date with was in fact <laughs> Steve Davis. <laughs> Which, to be honest. He's probably one of eight people that actually own this bedding set. So <laughs> just the image of him going, "Come into the bedroom. I'm going to show you something very interesting." <laughs> and it's just the bedding. It's nothing else. Yes, yeah, the nugget. I... <laughs> I don't want to hear about his nugget. <laughs> <laughs> right. Uh, well, there you go. Well, that's this episode. Yeah, right, I, I have to say, Tom, you've you've you've. I've done yourself on that one. That was very good. That was very, very good. Well, I do feel like um, this period, kind of April and May, is when there'll be a lot of weird snooker items on eBay. 
because it's when people know people are looking for it. So if we're ever going to find interesting stuff, it's it's right now, mm, isn't it? Mm, well, absolutely, yeah. I, I mean, uh, I, I challenge you to find weirder and less useful stuff than that. But um... what do you mean, yes, useful? It's a babe magnet, <laughs> mate. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you call it whatever you want. <laughs> Won't make it any better. I mean, by by babe, I do mean the pig from the film. I <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> I mean, may, perhaps, perhaps it's what, um, you know, Mark Selby had on his bed to get there is Vicky, you know. Um, <laughs> yeah, I just... Um, I'm beyond belief, to be honest, that 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 exists, and that, to be honest, people bought it. You know, this this Hurricanes person has bought it and has now gone. Oh my God, I've got a snooker bathroom <laughs> bedding set. <laughs> now I need to get rid of it, and they've been listing it for nearly forty years on eBay. <laughs> and now they invented eBay just to only sell now. Item. Only now, <laughs> when two people like me and you come along, it has a chance of being sold. <laughs> and 15 quid? I mean, you know, for a single doofy, yeah, that's, uh, that's a, lot of, a lot of wonga, that, for, for a doofy. Single doofy. If it was a king size, I might consider it. I mean, I'm struggling to imagine the proportions on a king size doofy. <laughs> To be honest. Would it be the size of an actual snooker table that way? Uh, it was fairly close. I think well, it's about ten by six a king size. I think so. The things, the things that, happen. that happen on a on a twelve by six, Tom. <laughs> there you go. That's all I can say. That's all I can say. I mean, surely there's got to be some big break merch with John Virgo on a. On a duvet set somewhere. Well, if you, if you want to search for it and try and <laughs> find it for the next episode, mate, you're more well, than welcome. Yeah, and do let us know in the comments if you indeed own one of these, or if you are Hurricanes himself and are willing to donate it to the Snooker Loopy podcast cause. You know, uh, we will give you a shout out. Or if and, you are uh, if you are Hurricanes himself and you want to just put it on eBay. And this podcast will clearly lead to it being sold for about 80 quid because everyone's going to rush over to eBay. <laughs> well, I can imagine Alec is, is going to be up there straight away. I think Tom is going to be up there straight away. Mm-hmm. Um, Liam? Oh, Liam, yes, Liam. And who was the person that commented? It was like Linda or something that commented on the Peter Ebden video. But there's no so... Ebden's not on this one. She won't want it. <laughs> well, he might be on the blue ball that he couldn't spot. <laughs> I don't want that image so. in my head. <laughs> Peter Emdo and his blue balls. Yeah. Oh dear. Right, well, anyway. Um cue the laughter. Cue the cue the scarred for life, I think is what we're gonna have to <laughs> call this part of the episode. <laughs> but um bum. But yeah, there we go, Joe. I think that is um <laughs> our little well our, our big preview episode. Done. I'm going to be interested how you edit this, Tom. I'm just going to edit I out. I think you're going to be up a, a fair amount of the night trying to get this to a reasonable length. Yeah. And some of our nonsense cut out. <laughs> yeah, I think I will. So I, I do feel like um, it might actually be a quicker edit because there's probably a good chunk that we, is just us talking about the championship. So I can just leave that in. Okay, I thought... I could have said something else to be honest, but what? yeah, I thought you were going to say uh, the good length of us uh, was talking about Steve Davis's balls, but I oh, know that's staying in. That's I might just release that a bit <laughs> as the podcast, <laughs> so people go, "Oh, what's this? Um, what's this world championship?" <laughs> that uh, can be a comedy video for tomorrow. There you go, sorted. Yep, there we go. <laughs> Deary me, deary me. But it's been a pleasure as always, mate. Oh yes, and uh, I'm looking forward to the snooker starting up and um, hearing what Ronnie's announcement is in the morning. You know, that's going to keep me up all night. And I'll be up all night editing. 
<laughs> well, good luck with that. Good luck with that. But uh, yes, we will be back throughout the, the World Championship, so I hope you enjoy it at home as well. Obviously, let us know in the comments on YouTube um, if you want to tell us your predictions uh, for the, the, the World Championship. How many qualifiers did you get right? That sort of thing. And uh, who is your tip to become a world champion? I think before we end off, we need a quick answer from both of us. Who is going to win the 2023 Kazoo World Championship? Should we say it in three, two, one? Mark Ronnie Allen. O'Sullivan. Oh, you've there gone you for go. Ronnie. I've gone for Ronnie. I've gone for, I'm going to go for Alan. I just feel like it's his time. But we'll see. We'll see. Mark Allen or Ronnie. We will see. Yeah. Oh, one thing I will say just before we uh, sign off is that there was a bit in the last podcast where you were talking about everyone's favourite snooker animal. Because uh, we talked about the, the pigeon and you said, what's your favourite <laughs> snooker animal or crucible an- animal? And I believe it was Alloc who commented his favourite was John Parrott. Oh, that's a that's a clever one. There we go. I thought you'd like that. Yeah. I do, I do like it. Yes, I'm. T- I mean, the dragon, Ding Junhui. Yeah. You know, um, the Lincolnshire sausage, <laughs> St- <laughs> Stephen Holworth. Oh, the sausage, <laughs> my favourite animal. <laughs> yeah, I can't think of any other animal-related <laughs> nicknames, but um, do let us know if you know any more. There must be some more. That could be a future episode. We do it. We can make a snooker zoo. <laughs> now, he has a quick question. <laughs> um, Ricky Walden. Mm. What do we think his nickname's going to be? Because uh, he was always the marathon man, and he came out in an interview fairly recently saying, I only ever ran one marathon. So yeah. it was a stupid nickname. Do we think it's going to be the walnut? Oh, I hope not. That's, I, I think it might be like Tricky Ricky Borden or Tricky Ricky. <laughs> I don't know. Well, we'll find out tomorrow, two <laughs> thirty, or we'll, today when this. I think Rob Walker will just improvise out. it, and it might be anything. He might panic and go, <clears throat> uh, "It's uh, the chocolate M and M. It's Ricky Walden." <laughs> Or the Lincolnshire sausage, <laughs> or the Chester sausage. I think he's from Chester, so there you go. I'm gonna, I'm gonna actually see what his current nickname is on Wikipedia. We know that that's a very reliable source of nickname information. Yep, it's very. The well. walnut. There you go. Oh, no. oh, I don't like that. The walnut. There we go. He can go in our zoo. The, the walnut. Exhibition. <laughs> Absolutely. Right, uh, I'll, we'll end it there. Thank you guys very much for listening. If you've listened this far, then please do uh, leave a like or a comment on whatever platform you listen on. Um, if you're listening on Spotify or any of the the podcast things or on my YouTube channel, then do go over to Joe's YouTube channel, Captain Goodspeed, because he is bringing back his Ronnie O'Sullivan Snooker 19 career. And if you enjoyed this episode, do check out the, the series, because it's a fantastic series. And I believe Joe will also be going for his eighth world championship. <laughs> not quite, not quite, not that many. Fifth in a row, though, and uh, oh, Ronnie's that's rubbish, tenth, then. God, only five... tenth in game. It would be his tenth in game. Only five in uh, a row? God, yeah. try harder, mate. <laughs> yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure I'll do it, but we'll see. It'll be a good laugh anyway. I promise not to talk too much about betting in that series. <laughs> That's good to hear, mate. It's really good to hear. <laughs> yep. Good night, JV. <laughs> See you, Dennis. <laughs>